All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Extending Empathy Project uh, Colloquium. Featuring tonight, Dr. Teresa Rojas uh, from the Department of English at Modesto Junior College. She'll be presenting tonight on Narrative as Empathy Training. My name is Dr. Nathan Carpenter. I am the Director of Convergent Media for the School of Communication at Illinois State University, and I'll be providing technical direction for tonight's presentation. Uh, there are two things to be aware of. Uh, the first is that if you are joining us on Zoom tonight, if you have questions uh, during the talk itself, feel free to post those in the chat and we'll save those until the end of the presentation uh, for Dr. Rojas to address. If you're joining us on YouTube, uh, we'll be following the comments um, in that space. And if you do have any questions or comments that you would like to post, uh, feel free to post those there and we'll bring those into the conversation as well. If there, uh, do keep in mind though that there is about a 20 second delay. And so we may not see those uh, immediately, but we will do our best to bring those into conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Scott Jordan from the Department of Psychology. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. As he said, I'm Scott Jordan from the Department of Psychology here at Illinois State University. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Extending Empathy Project on the road to Tulsa. This project actually started in the fall of 2018 when I sent a call out to faculty and graduate students, inviting them to be part of a project that would extend a more empathetic voice to the university community and to the public at large. You can see that in the first year, we were able to produce 10 colloquia. Um, the year after that, um, we were able to produce four. Due to COVID, the number was smaller. And then later on in the summer, I was working with Drs. Carpenter Craig um, and Hunt, and uh, we decided we needed to provide some alternative programming on uh, June, what was the date there? Uh, June 20th at 7 p.m. Central Time. And so Dr. Craig and Dr. Rocco gave an amazing talk entitled, What Should Empathy Be Like in This Moment of Historical Reckoning? Reconciling Black Trauma, Whiteness, and the Historical Structure of Racism Since 2019. This was an absolutely amazing talk. And as soon as it, was as it was finished, we knew that we needed to do another extending empathy project entitled On the Road to Tulsa. So some of you have been coming to these things every time we've done them. At this time, I just wanna thank all of you for coming to all of these. I, I just wanna give a special shout out to my colleagues, Dr. Carpenter, Dr. Hunt, Dr. Craig. Um, this has just been an ambition and now we've made it happen. And all of these talks have been organized so that we can all be ready to hear what Dr. Craig and Rackle have to say on June 1st. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Stephen Hunt, Director of the School of Communication here at Illinois State University. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us this evening. The School of Communication is proud to co-sponsor the Extending Empathy Project with the Department of Psychology. There's a few people that I'd like to thank specifically before we get started tonight. So Dr. Carpenter, who you met earlier for providing all of that technical direction and support for the Extending Empathy Project. He's been amazing in that role. Um, to Dr. Byron Craig, along with Dr. Jordan, we are um, working with the National American Democracy Project to expand this out to the universities that are affiliated with the ADP. And we're hoping to make that happen next year. So we're excited about where we're going in the future with this project. Uh, Dean Diane Zosky has been an amazing advocate for this, this project. Yeah, she was a speaker last week, or was it last time? Last week, um, but she's been an amazing advocate as well. And then Dr. Felice Noodleman, who's the executive director of the National American Democracy Project, has also been an advocate for this work. Um, so we thank her for that. So now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Craig to give us a little intro for the speaker tonight. All right, thank you, Dr. Hunt. So originally from San Francisco, Dr. Teresa Rojas is a professor of English and the first professor of ethnic studies at Modesto Junior College, where she teaches literature, creative writing, composition, comparative media, and Latinx studies with a focus on visual culture and comic studies. One of her specialties is graphic medicine, which is the intersection of medically related narratives and comics. She is also a McNair scholar, 
artist and traveler who has visited 11 countries and 40 US states. Her artwork um, has appeared in numerous group and uh, solo exhibits and has been collected internationally. Dr. Rojas is the founding director of the Latinx Comic Arts Festival. LCAF is the, is, is the California Central Valley's international celebration of Latinx comic arts creators and friends, spotlighting Latinx cartoonists, writers, animators, artists, and comic arts educators. She did pre-doctoral and post-doctoral study and teaching in the comparative media writing program at MIT, where she completed her dissertation, Manifold Imaginaries, Lat Latino Intermedial Narratives in the 21st Century. Her PhD is from the Ohio State University. She also holds a master's in women's studies from Eastern Michigan University and a bachelor's in English from UC Berkeley. Dr. Rojas' current scholarly projects focus on the intersection of Latin nexus and graphic medicine and include a growing anthology of works from writers and cartoonists telling their stories of trauma, illness, and healing in comics form. She is a faculty senator who also serves on the executive board of the Graphic Medicine International Collective, the editorial board of Amalt Comics, and the director of cultural equity for reading and pictures, and on the advisory council for the Latinx Pop Lab at UT Austin. Her superpowers include baby swaddling and the ability to engage her nieces and nephews without electronics. So without further ado, Dr. Rojas, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Craig. I really appreciate that. And those are my major superpowers. I feel it's very important to mention them. Swaddling is a thing. I got the burrito down and I don't have children. So <laughs> um, I want to also thank Dr. Jordan for the invitation to speak today. And of course, Illinois State and sponsors for hosting me. I'm honored and very excited to be here to share this work. And some of this is in progress. Um, some of this is um, a revisitation of, of work that I'm building. So I'm very, very happy to, to get it out there. Um, narrative as empathy training has until recently for me meant really thinking about how we perceive, interpret and remember stories. So that is other people's stories. And I want to suggest here today that empathy grows and that, that is that we develop a close, um, potentially transformative understanding of others' lives when we in fact begin to tell our own stories. So this is a foundational epiphany as I talk today about the power of memoir, memoir writing, memoir creation. So to launch that idea, I'd like to begin with stories. Stories really about the passing of my mother in 2017. So this is the story in several versions. Number one, in the summer of 2016, I moved back to California from Boston where I had, where I had been for a couple of years finishing my PhD and then doing a postdoc at MIT. That December, my mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. My stepdad told me not to go telling everyone that she was sick. People are nosy, he said. This is not their business. Six months later, she passed. Version two. In December of 2016, my mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It was my first year back in California after 18 years living in the Midwest and Northeast. She was given six months to live. She passed in June of 2017. I am now the only driver on that side of the family. Version three, June 25th, 2017, Modesto, California, email. Colleagues, on June 10th, my mom passed away at home in Antioch. As I shared with some of you, she was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer earlier this year, and we were fortunate to have her with us for almost six full months thereafter. She was particularly happy to have me back in California and I was visiting when she passed. I often weave stories about her in class or I say to my students, don't tell my mom I said that when you meet her. I certainly wish they could have met her. She would have told them something like, I know my daughter is bossy, but 
School is important, so do your homework, but don't work so hard that you don't see your family. Oh, and call your mother. The celebration of life is this Saturday. In lieu of flowers, my, my family's asking for donations in any amount to help with expenses as there were no pre-arrangements. Folks may use the link below or contact me directly. A big thanks to everyone who shared resources with me over the past few months. Teresa. Version four. This is a poem called Don't Ask Me, Fall 2017. You ask me how my summer was and you ask me how my summer was. How was my magical summer, you ask me, my wonderful, bright California summer. You ask me how my summer was and I want to yell, to scream, to aim at you the anger that is not about you at all, but about my loss, my grief, my pain, my desperation, because my summer was hot and terrible and inexplicably sad. It was the summer that everything changed. Just a year after earning my PhD, I earned a different kind of degree in lessons we can only learn through loss. You see, my mother died. My mother is dead. My mother is gone. And you asked me how my summer was. How about you read your email? And don't ask me how my summer was and whether I went anywhere fun or did any gardening or made it to the beach or the city or Yosemite for fuck's sake. Don't ask me how my summer was because I spent it explaining to my four-year-old niece why abuelita, she called her Ita, is gone, gone, gone. Don't ask me because I don't know how to explain the feeling of utter madness, the sadness and neurological chaos that turned my brain upside down when I went to pick up my sister from Fairfield, loading up all of her belongings from the trailer, a literal trailer, where she was living with her piece of shit baby daddy, loaded up her shit bag by garbage bag, loaded up my niece, all boots and pink things, and my sister, and headed back to mom's. Don't ask me why I stopped at the taco truck because everyone was so hungry and tired. Don't ask me why it took so damn long. Don't ask me why I was ordering tacos while my mom was dying in front of my middle sister taking her last breaths. There's a name for it, you know. They gave us a pamphlet about the last weeks and months, but for us, it was just hours. Before the secretions in the back of my mother's throat caused that sound, the death rattle. While I was freezing in front of that fucking taco truck thinking everything would be fine if we could all just get something to eat, don't ask me how. We drove into the garage and as I eased the van into its usual spot, exactly one foot in front of the washing machine, my stepfather opened the door to the house looking flushed, wrecked, heartbroken and sat and said she's gone. Don't ask me how I screamed and ran into the house, down the hall, into my mom's room yelling, no, no, no. And I'm sorry, come back. Just come back, I'm so sorry. Don't ask me how my mom passed as the door of the garage went up, as though she knew her three daughters were all together again, safe. And don't ask me how I missed my mom's passing by 10 long seconds. Don't ask me to explain how I was convinced that if only I had made it back in time, she would still be alive today. They gave her six months and almost to the day my mother was gone. So don't ask me how my summer was unless your mom died too, in which case you should know better than to ask me. Part two, I'm going to now start a PowerPoint. All 
right. Well, the, the title of my talk as a whole is called Soul Exchange, Narrative as Empathy Training. And I promise that we will come back to talking a little bit about that, about that poem and, and why I shared that with you. So part two is called Johnny Legs and the Biblical Piñata of Locusts. And I realize that you can see some of the side bits here. We are doing an alternate navigation, so bear with me here. John Leguizamo's Ghetto Clown is a graphic memoir adaptation of the one-man stage play, an HBO special of the same name. The narrative depicts Leguizamo's real life development as a writer and performer coping with the debilitating anxiety that accompanied his rise to fame. Through depictions of enduring childhood trauma and Hollywood racism, Leguizamo illustrates the potentially devastating anxieties of autobiography, the challenges of a Latinx actor and what he calls Hollywoodens and the providence of learning to turn destructive impulses into creative ones. So I read John Leguizamo's Ghetto Clown, a graphic novel as both graphic memoir and a graphic pathography. Graphic pathographies are emerging forms of illness narrative depicting medically related issues in comics form. While these frequently autobiographical narratives are flourishing in popularity and include such well-known volumes as Harvey Picard's Our Cancer Year, Marissa Acochella Marchetto's Cancer Vixen, which is super funny, by the way, I had a, a whole debate with someone about whether or not you should give someone who's been diagnosed with cancer a graphic novel about being diagnosed with cancer. And the answer is yes, you should. It's very funny. And um, I gave it to a friend of mine who was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she said it was the it was the best thing that she could have had in that moment. So I was very happy about that. Um, David David Small Stitches is also well known. Ellen Forney's Marbles that deals with um, uh, mania, depression, and bipolar disorder, and uh, Paul Dumlap Scholl's My Degeneration. Now, there's a noticeable absence here of scholarly and artistic work focusing on people of color and people of color and depictions of illness. These graphic memoirs that I mentioned that I'm showing here are also explicitly read as stories of illness. So the ghetto clown that I'm going to discuss a bit today is read on, on multiple levels as a different kind of uh, graphic novel what I'm calling a graphic memoir. Ghetto Clown is a fully multicultural venture as well with co-illustrators Krista Cassano and Seamus Bialy of Canadian First Nations, Cynics, and New Mexican Navajo ancestry respectively. So Ghetto Clown is the story of Leguizamo's development as an actor, his rise to fame and his struggle with mental illness. It is as complex as it is compelling. Well, that's graphic medicine. I will leave that there. So there's a huge and often unspoken gap in the growing discipline of graphic medicine in terms of the diverse contributions to what Williams refers to as the depository of images that critically inform our collective conceptions of illness and healthcare. What Gilman brands is the iconography of illness. I love that phrase, the iconography of illness. In other words, people, sorry, people of color are rarely represented. Our stories are simply not told or largely invisible. So back it up just a second. What exactly is graphic medicine for folks who aren't familiar? Coined by Welsh physician and cartoonist Ian Williams, who's also a friend of mine, the term graphic medicine came together as Williams was working on his MA thesis in medical humanities. As he noted the growing number of comics and graphic novels that dealt with medical content, he created the website graphicmedicine.org, which is fantastic. And it has come a long way over the years. And this is really the main website for the study of and the exploration of graphic medicine. 
And he did this to begin cataloging such texts as the ones that I showed earlier. So full disclosure, I'm now on the executive board of the Graphic Medicine International Collective. So I'm going to say all nice things about graphic medicine and graphicmedicine.org because I love all things graphic medicine. So in the groundbreaking uh, 2015 text, Graphic Medicine Manifesto, Williams, Serwick et al. assert, quote, graphic medicine is the intersection of the medium of comics and the discourse of healthcare. It's an approach to the education of healthcare professionals, as well as an emerging area of interdisciplinary academic study. So practitioners of graphic medicine include a wide range of people from doctors, cartoonists, comic scholars, literature professors, artists, writers, healthcare workers, medical students, and, and comic enthusiasts in general. Even traditional superhero comics have been dealing with issues of fragile bodies for years. Jose Alanis's 2014 Death, Disability, and the Superhero, for example, points to how hypermasculinity, among other things, masks underlying vulnerabilities of serious disabilities in a multitude of superheroes, including Superman, Iron Man, etc. He points to, quote, awareness of related body issues in the post-war United States as represented by hospice, death with dignity, and disability rights movements, end quote. This was traditionally the domain of the doctor or medical artist who wielded power by controlling and standardizing the way that diseases were visualized. Graphic medicine sees to, seeks to disrupt this power imbalance um, and believes that those best positioned to represent illness and caregiving are those who are living with it. So that brings us back to Ghetto Clown. In the opening of, of his show, because remember I said that the, the book is based on his, uh, the HBO special, which is based on the, the show that he created, the stage play. He states, hello, I'm going to give you a piece of my soul. And if you give me a piece of your soul and we do this right, we'll have a soul exchange, a soul exchange. For me, this captures the essence of the creation and consumption of autobiographical texts. A soul exchange suggests a process by which empathy is not only possible, but probable. So I really love that phrase, a soul exchange. Leguizamo was born in Bogota, Colombia, and grew up in Queens, New York, and was well on the road to juvenile delinquency as an adolescent, which is, he, he, is, he says this himself. He depicts his behavior much in response to a punishing machista father. Eventually, acting becomes John's release and source of vigor. Here, in an image that readers see twice in the graphic novel. And by the way, I use graphic novel and graphic memoir interchangeably in this talk. Um, if I were being very particular about it, I would say that they're actually two different things, but we don't need to go there today. <laughs> they're related, they're cousins. So um, John discovers the power of acting. The text reads, I didn't realize I had all this anger in me. For the first time in my life, I learned how to take all my self-destructive impulses and turn them into creative impulses. John's silhouette depicted here in negative space with mouth open and arm raised as though speaking into a microphone is filled with scribbles of various line thickness, suggesting this perpetual motion and focal vortex for his anger. We later discover that John struggles with mental illness, which is traditionally extremely challenging to depict in visual form. If you think about it, it's really hard to, to effectively depict depression, for example. Like, what do you do? Do you draw a cloud that's sort of raining? Do you draw scribbles? Do you draw, um, you know, what, how is it that you visually represent? What kind of iconography do you choose to represent um, depression and, and mental illness? And then he says, I also learned that there are a lot of hot chicks in these acting classes. <laughs> so that was the motivation. When John attempts to share his triumph with his father, 
he is mocked and ridiculed. In this scene, when John tells his father he's found his calling as an actor, his father, depicting sitting on the toilet, calls him derogatory names and throws John out of the house. The audience here is clearly meant to feel the disappointment of these dreams, not just cast aside, but if we take a look at that last panel, flushed away. So the dialogue, dad, I got a plan. I figured out how I'm gonna get you out of this place. I'm gonna put you in a brownstone and mom and me, cause I'm gonna be an actor. Pero que demonios, tu eres mongolico o, o I'm gonna skip that word because we didn't we didn't go into this country come to this country. For, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the the um, the way the language is depicted because I'm I'm sort of flashing back to my dad who would be really angry with me saying things um, and with the accent. So I'm gonna to skip to the panel. I'm warning I'm warning you become an actor and you get the hell out of my house. And then he flushes the, the toilet. So, <laughs> sorry dad. Earlier when John is younger and getting into trouble, he winds up in jail after an incident on the subway. His father appears to bail him out and through John's eyes, literally, oh, literally depicted eye shapes, it's the next slide right here, um, we see the imposing and very pissed off figure of his father as Darth Vader. And he says, why are you crying, Mariconcito? Which, um, I'll let you look that one up. Um, in the next panel, he sees stormtroopers who have arrived as backup for the moment. Here, Vader and the stormtroopers are manifestations of John's angst as it intertwines with both his imagination and this moment in popular culture. I really love that in this page, not only that his father has become Darth Vader, so you can sort of imagine the theme song as the dad appears, but that the perspective, that John's young perspective is that the eyes are actually carved out. So we get these panels that are in eye shape, which I think is super interesting. So another trajectory of the book depicts the anxiety of what Leguizamo calls Hollywoodans, I mentioned before. Leguizamo shares, quote, I learned that no matter how fucked up your life was, you could put that shit down on paper, end quote. Indeed, this is how he dealt with the trials of his career, family, and his inner demons. As he was navigating the new world of Hollywood, invigorated by opportunity, we learned that he was also navigating his own emotions about success, about happiness, and, wh and why he was unable to fully grasp a feeling of fulfillment from his career. Leguizamo uses caricature to construe his relationship with depression and self-esteem. So at various moments, in his career, we see John struggling. And I, when I say John, I'm referring to the character in the book versus Leguizamo, the author. We see John struggling with depression. In this recurring set of pages, John directly expresses his emotion, his emotions. I was depressed and we have these long uh, rectangular panels. I was depressed and when I'm depressed, I sleep too much. I don't wanna see or talk to anyone. And then I down too much coffee and then I can't sleep. So I drink too much and I lie around thinking about death. And I can't stop beating off. And then I'm disgusted with myself and I hate myself and I can't leave the house because I repulse myself. It's interesting here that not only is John narrating the cycle of depression, but also that cycle is visually represented with repeating horizontal black silhouettes of John lying on his back, simulating a kind of death shroud. And then in the last panel, an epiphany. But this time when I hit bottom, I heard a voice in my head, John, stop playing with your little gangster and pick up a pen and write down your experiences. Eugene O'Neill did it, August Wilson, Garcia Lorca, and Sam Shepard did it too. Thus, the vulnerability of this cycle of depression and self-abuse leads to a critical moment of revelation. 
write down your experiences, implicitly suggesting that those experiences also be shared. An exchange of souls to help purge the demons. So when I'm working with this text in class, <laughs> My students really love this page. They want to dwell here for quite a while. It's, it gets a little embarrassing, actually. They want to talk about what's going on in every panel and the silhouettes and the shape of the silhouettes. But I think that what they're really getting at is this idea of writing down your experiences and just sort of exposing, being very raw with these experiences and how transformative that, that can be. But inevitably, I've taught it maybe three or four times now. And this is one of the the pages that folks want to talk about. So on the set of Tu Wang Fu, you may recall this movie, uh, Tu Wang Fu with Love, Julie Newmar, we see a spectacularly constructed scene of John hitting rock bottom. The actor shows up to work late, he's drunk, he's full of mezcal and fried grasshoppers, having binged on both for hours, not even just the night before, but going into the morning of this shoot. In the next scene, Patrick Swayze grows increasingly angry, and this all happened, by the way. And John responds with growing belligerence, and we see the panels go askew. So I love the, the motion and the geometry that's happening here. So we have these three panels on the one page, and then as the action gets more intense, we get more, more geometry, more line work, um, and more of the panels going askew. As the horror of what's about to happen increases, so too the drama of the geometry of the panels. Culminating in the scenes, what I like to call, I'm very proud of this phrase, vomitous denouement. <laughs> that takes equal advantage of visual geometry to punctuate the actor's final humiliation. So he says, he narrates, I threw up all over poor Patrick and his pashmina and his Jimmy Choo shoes. It was a biblical piñata of locusts, little thoraxes and wings and antennae. It's what I get for being cheap. I'm sorry, Patrick, head for the hills. Run, Wesley, save yourself. Wesley Snipes was also in this movie. And then this is the, the vomitus denouement. Both panel and image geometry are key, key in the reader's cognitive experience of this moment. Run, everybody, I'm disgusting. I don't wanna die, oh God, oh God. So, this, I think, is just visually wonderful. It's just beautiful. This moment, you've got three Johns, right? The one who's, who's sort of like, it's over. He's on his knees. He feels like he's going to die. And then the one who is, uh, and he's also <laughs> spewing. And then the two who are underneath this just ridiculousness of, uh, of what he has been binging on for the last several hours. Okay, so we're gonna go. I'm gonna give everyone a rest from this visual. <clears throat> Leguizamo's choice of adapting his stage play to graphic novel is significant. So in the preface to Ghetto Clown, he explains, quote, you can travel to places visually with the graphic novel medium that even movies can't quite capture. This is the magic of putting pen to paper and it's one of the most exciting ventures I've undertaken yet. End quote. Zarek and others note, quote, comic studies has the capacity to include and speak to diverse communities. Comic studies has the real potential to produce a public and open criticism that is responsive and accessible to both specialists and non-specialists, to creators and critics, to casual readers and aficionados, to academics and non-academics alike, end quote. So I want to take a moment to talk about the artists of Ghetto Clown. And this is the final part of this section. Ghetto Clown is fully intercultural. It's a fully intercultural venture with the co-illustrators, Krista Cassano and Seamus Tiali. In researching the construction of Leguizamo's book, 
I was intrigued by an interview with Cassano. I want to show uh, just a brief picture of, this is an interview with uh, Krista Cassano. This is Seamus Piali here. So in this interview, uh, Cassano, who's from Spokane, Washington, she's a First Nation cynic and a member of the Colville tribe on her mother's side and a second generation Italian from Calabria on her father's. And she notes, quote, it was really important for me to work on this book because I related so much to its contents. A lot of my art career before coming to comics and a very large reason why it took me so long to start making them is because I was without exaggeration, crippled and at times paralyzed by fear. I've never really been able to understand why it is so painfully humiliating to me to have my work out there in the world in front of other people's eyes. It has been such a major struggle that at times I've become physically ill and suffered nervous conditions similar to the ones John describes in the book, end quote. Cassano's expression of fear here and her willingness to overcome that fear in order to bring a text like Ghetto Clown to life is crucial in building, um, building the study of a, a really diverse corpus of artwork upon we, which we continue to um, build our analyses and also understanding that even as we promote that idea of the soul exchange from earlier. So Green and Myers uh, suggest graphic pathographies can be used in a novel and creative way to learn and teach us about illness. But as I mentioned earlier, notably missing from the larger conversation of medical graphic narrative, narratives are stories by and about people of color and Latinos in particular. The Ghetto Clown is marketed as a graphic memoir and a celebrity graphic autobiography, but it is no less a graphic pathography. That is, Ghetto Clown is a story of mental illness and a struggle that we rarely hear firsthand from Latinx authors, let alone Latinx celebrities. So like so many areas of narrative, theory, literature, storytelling, narratology, current studies in graphic medicine are largely and noticeably dominated by Anglo narratives. Um, and I have often been the brown voice in the room <laughs> and uh, that, that is shifting but it's, it's been the case many, many times. And, um, you know, I take that on. In fact, the Graphic Medicine Manifesto I mentioned earlier that is co-written by a number of my friends, now friends, um, all of the authors are white. And that's noticeable, it's quite noticeable. From my own experience, I can confirm that Latinos in particular are, are reluctant to share stories of illness. In my own family, we were taught that one does not discuss such things out in the open, let alone writing them down and publishing them, right? You do not air your ropa sucia to the world. That's one's dirty laundry, and it is always private. So this is part of the problem. According to Leguizamo, Ghetto Clown is the history that I probably never should have told anyone but my therapist. But it's a real lesson that even if you suffer a certain amount, a lot, of self-doubt and anxiety, you can still accomplish great things. And it's a lesson I'm really excited to impart on a whole new audience. So back to the idea of the soul exchange. I want to shift to this next part, part three, which is about cartoonist Linda Berry. I wanna make some connections here. Some of you may be familiar with her. I see some nodding heads. Yeah, Linda Berry. So Linda Berry is a half Filipino, although she does not look half Filipino. And that's, that's something that she talks about all the time. And she's very Anglo, she's sort of Irish looking. But um, cartoonist Linda Berry is a, a big believer in building worlds by hand. And she um, does this amazing workshop. Um, she's coming out of the University of Wisconsin, Madison writing and drawing courses that have um, developed into mindful, mindfulness artistic practices anchored in the use of composition books where students illustrate the world around them. And, and I just love the idea of using a composition book for this. 
So syllabus notes from an accidental professor is printed to mimic a composition book. It's quote, a collection of bits and pieces from the many notebooks Barry kept during her first three years of trying to figure out how to teach this practice to her students. And so that, so if anyone is unfamiliar, this is what a normal composition book looks like, right? We're having nostalgic moments, are we? Are we kind of feeling that composition book energy? <laughs> and you can get these now. As a matter of fact, my nieces and nephew, uh, they do lots of their homework in these composition books. They're super cheap. They're like 50 cents a dollar each. Um, so the paper in a composition book is traditionally lined with light blue lines and is either wide or college ruled. It has a vertical line for a margin on the left hand of every page. And the lines are important. They offer guidelines for writers, but they're light enough as to easily be obscured when the image is drawn over them. So they don't create boundaries. They offer guidelines, but they don't create boundaries. The rule of the lines, wide or college, offers two different experiences. And I swear this is true. <laughs> A wide rule experience is not the same as a college rule experience. That distance is important. So if, you, if you're wanting to experiment with a composition book, you really got to choose carefully the wide rule and the college rule, different experiences, maybe try both. Barry advocates cultivating mindfulness as a critical way to develop a compelling storytelling practice. She shares her storytelling practices, which I think is, is really cool. Um, eschewing aesthetic judgments, that's important. She emboldens her students to focus on significant and varied mark making to foster an awareness of the world. She writes, or she asks, how do you stop saying nothing happened? <laughs> One way is to pay attention, to be quiet, to see what's there, end quote. For Barry's students, this means logging daily sensory observations in a composition book and then using this material as the catalyst for graphic storytelling. With substitute brain names, so she substitutes students' names for brain names like amygdala and neuron, very, very students are encouraged to consider how the physical process of drawing words and pictures triggers brain activity. And they are also reminded by these names that what they're doing is a cognitive process. Now, I tried this with a class one time I don't have the memory yet, the memory capacity yet to remember all of these names, but it's some, it's a goal of mine. And what I love about that is that it's, um, it, it, there's an equalizing factor in this because students choose their name. You can have some other sort of theme, but it, um, it's a way of allowing them to choose a different identity that has a connection to the process that you're trying to call attention to. Barry notes, quote, I had no idea that 40 years later, I would not only still be using a notebook as the most reliable route to the thing I've come to call my work, but I also be showing others how to use it too, as a place to practice a physical activity, in this case, writing and drawing by hand with a certain state of mind. So she opens the, uh, the actual syllabus with the notebook with the question, is creative concentration contagious? And if we were in class, I would ask everyone this question and we'd have a great discussion about it because of course the answer is yes, creative concentration is quite contagious. Anyone who's been in a writing group or an art group or even a crochet or knitting or where you're doing something collectively knows that there is, I like to use the technical terms, there's a groupiness about it, right? There's a groupiness in community that fires motivation. It's a catalyst. Um, and Barry asks, why is it? Why do we like to watch people creating stuff? It is a mystery to me because I have done that as well. Well, I will watch someone. Normally I would not be interested, but when you see someone creating something, you see the process of creation, drawing, I could watch someone draw all day long. Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics, which is the seminal comics theory text from the late 1990s, there really, there hasn't been anything quite um, like it. There's another book that focuses on cognitive processes, but it's not quite um, 
a replacement for McLeod. McLeod tells us that the lines, lines can convey senses and emotions, and we can observe this easily in comics. Remember that image of Leguizamo um, depicting the, the energy of being on stage, the, the anxiety, the nervousness, those are lines, right? The different, the line weight changes, the different thickness of the lines. So this is also true of typeface and printed words. Jared Gardner's work in storylines points us to the importance of the textual line as well, you know, the font. Linda Berry asserts that there is all the difference. This is one of my favorite Linda Berry quotes. There is all the difference in the world between writing and drawing the letter A and tapping it on the computer. Most people don't realize that they can draw, that when you write something by hand, you are drawing. And that, that process is, is kind of a miracle, right? And so I love to talk about this idea of typing something out is creative concentration contagious versus creating a handwritten version of that same question. It's a different process altogether. It's a, it's a different, what you get out of it is quite different. So the last thing about Barry that I wanna mention, oh, before I get to the two questions, um, if you haven't heard of this book, uh, it's called 100 Demons. This is uh, Linda Barry's, she calls auto, Wait, let me get this right. Autobiographicalography. I think I got that. <laughs> and it's uh, autobiographical, but potentially with fictional bits, which I would argue is really the truth, the truth of any story that we tell about our own lives, right? Because we are remembering, we're putting things back together the way that we remember them. In the, in, to use an example of my mom, she would tell this lovely story about one Thanksgiving, when I came home, I was living in the Midwest. I came home. We had this great Thanksgiving. This happened. That happened. We laughed. We cried. We <laughs> uh, and it was a great story. Well, I had never gone home for Thanksgiving. So this story that she loved never happened. It absolutely never happened. But she told it over and over again. And I still don't know what that was all about. But it was a great story. So I, I sort of let her have it. Um, so Barry's 100 Demons tells the story of the angst of growing up. And in addition to that, she shares her process. She discusses the process of creating with an ink stone, which I have, and they're wonderful, an ink stick. And this idea of drawing one's demons, whatever that means. And that in the process of drawing one's demons, we are processing in the process of drawing, we're processing those demons. So this is a great book, and I wanted to make sure to, to shout it out so that um, the folks are interested. I'm not getting a kickback or anything, just so you know. Um, so the two questions, the final piece of, of Barry, and then I will um, get to wrapping up here. These two questions that she points out are two questions that as, as creators, and I think that we're all creators to some, to some degree, but those of us who, who create stories, who write stories, especially when it comes to sharing you know, family stories and personal things, the two questions that come up are, is this good and does this suck, right? These are the questions that keep us from creating Barry says, I'm not sure when these two questions became the only questions I had about my work or when marking, making pictures or stories turned into something I called my work. I just know that I stopped. I stopped enjoying it and instead I began to dread it. These two questions, this is, this is me, these two questions kill the soul exchange. And you know when it happens, it happens when we're, it starts to happen when we're little. And you know, the joy of drawing. So I'll sit down with my nieces and my nephew and they will just draw, 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 draw. And sometimes they're just scribbling like crazy. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, that's not a thing. Whatever you're drawing, that's not a thing. But I, you know, <laughs> try to keep it to myself because I don't want to kill the joy of whatever it is that they're making. But at some point we start to judge. And if, you, if you're getting also the messages 
that it's not okay to share what's happening in your life, to share what's happening in your family, then that, that um, cuts off the creative process. Comics creation, the building of images is a cognitive process and the brain not only has to work to make rhetorical choices, but also to fill in the gaps of time and space between panels and create a puzzle that will make sense to the reader. So circling back. Let me go to this slide here. So I started this talk with bits of narrative and a poem about the passing of my mother. And when, um, when I started to process, when I started to really think about and, and having a moment, excuse me. <laughs> when, I, when I wanted to create something in order to really process her passing, I wanted to do a painting because I was I was painting all the time. That was just, that was my my form my major form of art. I fancied myself Frida Kahlo maybe and <laughs> able to paint through the pain. I was sure that I was going to create these this whole you know, evocative works of the life of my mother and how she made us feel. And my sisters and I had a very difficult relationship with my mother. And somehow these pieces would move the world, you know, it would take me a year and then uh, they would capture the hearts of all of our viewers, my viewers. And <laughs> anyway, what I discovered is that I can't do that. I can't paint sadness. I had nothing. I had no, I couldn't even sketch. I tried sketching some ideas and my, one of my sisters said, oh, you should do a butterfly. And I was like, eh, I don't really think of butterflies when I think of mom. Uh, so that's when the poetry started to take form. And it turned out that that was a way that I could really express not just the feeling of loss, but this, um, this idea of this idea of the complications of my relationship and my sister's relationship with my mom. And I'm going to stop this share. And for my last it. I can't find the button. I have lost the stop share button, so we'll figure that out. Well, no idea where that went. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for kicking me out. <laughs> Great. So um, I am now, and the reason that I shared the poem in the beginning is that I'm now working with, um, we've just started talking about this, um, with my sisters on choosing images to, to um, tell the story of the poem that I shared, which is from a, a chapbook, the chapbook is called, it's called Don't Ask Me. And it is um, poems inspired by the passing of my mom, um, but also <laughs> we like to call uh, escandalo poems about boys and uh, things that I couldn't really write about while my mom was alive. And um, it's been it's been a really interesting um, process because the poem the last piece that I'm going to share with you so so there's a conversion happening where the pieces from from this about my mom are going to become comics my sisters would say oh that that's a great story that that would make a good comic there are all these funny things that happened in the process of her death which sounds very weird but one of them was when she was when she was um, in hospice. So none of us had ever ex experienced any, anything related to hospice. We didn't really understand that we were going to be caregivers, right? That there was no special secret nurse that comes out of the woodwork to come and take care of your loved one who is very ill. They just came and brought a, a bed and all these things that we didn't know how to use. And they said, okay, call us if you need us. And there was a moment when we have to take my mom to um, use the, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's where, where the people go potty and it's not in the potty, it's a, there's a name for it that I forget. But we didn't know how to get her from the bed to the thing. And so there's this whole scene that happens where I'm pulling a sheet, my stepdad's trying to help over here, my sister's like diving under my mom, her flip-flop goes flying. We're trying to figure out what direction to go next. And it's horrifying, right? 
but it was also one of the funniest moments because then at the end my sister's just like where's my shoe I lost my shoe in this whole thing and we just started sort of crying and laughing at the same time because we had no idea what we were doing that kind of thing I think would be a great comic the other piece and the last piece that I want to share is that um I, I really wanted to write a poem, a follow-up poem that dedicated to my mother, but that was really for my sisters. And it was because in, in her passing, so many of our relatives were, were telling us, oh, your, your mother was such an angel. She was such a, she was such a wonderful lady and she was so sweet. <laughs> we were just like, I'm sorry, who? Oh, okay. And it was, it was bothering all three of us. It was bothering us that there was this portrait of my mother that was very unlike the person that we knew. And so I was able to work that out and I read a, a draft of this piece to my sisters because I wanted to make sure that it was okay with them that it that sort of honored their experience as well. And they not only gave me the thumbs up, they were like, get it into the world as soon as you can. <laughs> Get the truth out there. But this is meant to, it is meant to honor my mom. So this is called Poem for My Mother. And, and I want to just warn everyone that uh, I use the, um, the word bitch a lot. So if that bothers you, you might want to continue. So Poem for My Mother, dedicated to my two sisters, Stephanie and Melissa A. By the way, I have two sisters named Melissa. Ask me later about that. Poem for My Mother. My mother was a mean ass bitch. I say that, believe it or not, with all due respeto and that complicated sort of reverence that a Latina daughter develops over the years of feeling, tasting, learning the raw sting of a mother's love. My mother was a who's in the bathroom, yell in your face, no one messes with me. I can say that because I'm the mom. I can do that because I'm the mom. You don't have to make sense because, excuse me, I don't have to make sense because I'm the mom. You can't change me. You can't convince me. I don't care what you think of me because I'm the mom, bitch. She was a no one is allowed in my home. Okay, invite your friends over so that they get to know me and love me and respect me. They think I'm so funny. Then after they leave, I can talk shit about them behind their back and deny it if you call me on it, bitch. She was a, why are you wearing that? You think you're better than everyone else. You are the most selfish daughter. You'll be sorry. You are nothing but a slut and such a little bitch, bitch. She was so unhappy with her life. She wanted everything from us. She wanted everything for us. Annoyed that she raised three girls who talked back, even as she taught us to do just that with the rest of the world. My mother was a chingona. She was a badass of the highest order. She was on the phone, taking notes, working the system, memo pad hoarding, clickety, clickety, clicking, pen, bitch. There was no chancla throwing because she was a Velcro tennis shoe wearing, reading the Lane Bryant catalog, Spiegel's mail ordering, bitch. She was a half price books buying, romance novel reading, The Duke is Coming for Me Someday, British mystery reading, PBS, Downton Abbey watching, bitch. She was a don't ever let a man tell you what to do. If you leave now, you can never come home. No one wants the cow when you can get the milk for free. Remember, you can always come home if you really need to. No Hallmark card expresses how hard it was growing up with her, how hard she was on us, how complex our relationship, how much we loved her even when we hated her. We could never understand why. My mother would shave her eyebrows off just to draw them back on. Plastic, curlered, pelo, pintado, contradictory as fuck, loving, caring, yelling, screaming, raging, bitch. She was a capital B bitch who left each of her daughters a journal before she died. Three journals, 
just a few pages, just what she could muster, in between bouts of pain. Her last words to us were on paper, thoughts she could not say to us face to face, and we were so afraid to read those pages. <laughs> but eventually each of us did, and in mine, she wrote, 2317, my beautiful firstborn, I thought it was a mistake. Don't get too involved with work that then you miss out on life. She was my mother and I loved her. And sometimes I hated her because she made it so hard to love her. And I miss her every day. So I wanna end with what I always say at the end of every panel for the Latinx Comic Arts Festival. And that is that I encourage you to create the stories that you want to see in the world. Thank you. All right. So we're going to take this moment that, again, if you have any comments or questions that you'd like to uh, um, raise, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, there is one here already. And uh, uh, this is from uh, Dr. Craig in the chat. Actually, I want to turn to Dr. Craig. Would you like to ask it directly or would you like me to read it and field it from here? It might be easier if I just ask the question because yeah. I, was just, I was having this stream of consciousness thought as you were going through this whole thing, uh, Dr. Rojas. And I absolutely loved your talk. I thought it was very, um, uh, what can I say? I think, it, I think you were hitting on a really um, notion of uh, radical empathy uh, and I know this is not a new term, but I think it's, you know, your use of the creative here with the poetry, with the imagery. And, and by the way, I, just, I love the fact that you took the time to actually give us a visual reading. And, and I would call, I, I do visual rhetoric, right? And so I love the fact that you were doing this reading of the, um, the panels and the drawings and the graphic novels, right? Uh, but, I, but I think my question is, you know, I, I don't, sometimes I have a difficulty with separating the creative um, as a way of thinking about the political and where we are currently in, in this culture. And I hate to take this to the political, sorry about doing this to you, but I wonder if you could speak some to the, the, the way that what I see you doing as a radical form of empathy, um, the way this might transform um, our larger public culture Right through this use of the um, through this use of of, of um, this creativity, right? Because I think this really drew on this notion of the creative, and that's what I love so much about that. I don't think we give enough emphasis to the creative when we think about I scholarly agree. work, and we think about the, when we think about politics and where we are now. So, I wonder if you could speak to that. I hope that makes sense. What kind it of does. It actually really does, and I'm I'm so glad that you asked that because I was told early on. And it felt, it, is, it felt um, wrong. I was told early on, pick a lane, right? You cannot be a creative and an academic. And I was like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> and then it was um, Larry LaFontaine Stokes, who teaches at the University of Michigan, who came to Ohio State uh, to share his creative work. I think it's called, uh, something pintados oh shoot now i forgot blue nails painted blue nails um and it's a it's a book of um stories i think it's a collection of short stories that are in spanish and in english so and he is a professor at the university of michigan and i remember that was my first my very first year as a graduate scholar and he was there and i was part of this really cool program where we were we were mentoring undergraduates and we'd have speakers and and so he came and shared his work with us and I bought his book and, and um, he was talking about how that was evaluated, you know, academically or not evaluated or erased and the politics of that. And so someone in the audience, it might've been me, it might've been a good friend of mine said, so which do you do? You know, like, obviously you need to have the job. So you're gonna, like, how do you do academics and then the creative on the side? He said, no. No, <laughs> you do you. <laughs> you don't buy into this idea that you have to pick a lane and you just make it work. 
you can do as many things as you want to do. You, you just have to take control of the narrative, right? And I'm paraphrasing to some degree. And that really stuck with me, this idea of, okay, because I was already painting at that point and, and in the space where, where, where he had his talk, my paintings were all over the walls. So I was trying to figure out, well, can, can I ever do this again now that I'm a you know, grad student at the time? How do I keep this going? And he's just, if you want to do it, do it. So, but the messages that we get, and this is not just for scholars, I think this is in general, is that you can't, you can't be all things, obviously you can't be all things to all people, but you have to pick what you want to be when you grow up kind of thing. <laughs> you have to choose. And if you're going to be an artist, you know, you know, God help you. If you're going to be an artist, if you're going to be a professor, then you need to focus on that. And it's not, it's not a good idea to mix them. I am ridiculously fortunate that I wound up at a community college. This was not part of my vision. Um, you know, I went to R1 schools. I was at MIT for a couple of years. So I was like, Poo. And, and I could have stayed at MIT um, and become a lecturer there. But living in Boston is really difficult. And my family was pulling me back to, the, to California. So when I went on the job market, I was having trouble getting even an interview at, at the community college because they were like, she's just gonna be here for five minutes and then she's gonna leave. But Modesto interviewed me and they were like, grab her. <laughs> you know? And as I was ushered in to the campus and, and sort of expressing myself as an artist and, and all of these different sides, my Dean was just like, Yes, yes. And she said this, uh, we had our, our um, tenure ceremony last, last week, and she said this, you know, to the whole world, she said, my job as Dr. Rojas's dean is to listen to her crazy ideas and then find out how to help her make them come alive. So, you know, what more could I ask for? But the messages that we get that we have to fight against are, that's not okay. Or, um, you know, who are you, even from my own family, who do you think you are? You know, who are you trying to be? It was so much pushback from my family, from my mom in particular. I was just like, ugh. My mom would, when I would come up with, you know, whatever, whatever thing I was trying to have a conversation about that she didn't like, she would say, oh, that's Berkeley again. That's your, her Berkeley's coming out. You know, <laughs> what does that mean? I just want to have a conversation. And that's hard. I have students who I know are constantly getting pushback from the family because they're first generation or their, um, you know, families just don't quite understand because they're, they're the first ones through the gate. And so they don't know how to be supportive. They only know a particular way. So when I got into Berkeley, my mom said to me, who do you think you are? And I was, and I tell my students this all the time. I was like, I'm the, I am the one who got into Berkeley. <laughs> Can I go? And then, I, and then she was like, you need to get a job. Like what a bum I was. And I was just like, well, yeah, but I want to go to Berkeley. So it was, I was always pushing, pushing against that. That's very, I'm very long-winded. Um, but, but that, yeah. So I feel that, I feel that question um, deeply, very deeply. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your answer. I, I, I think everything you're saying also is really important to understand. We, you know, I think one of the things we have to think about is empathy also in the university, right? And thinking yeah. about for, for faculty of color, students of color, queer faculty, queer students, you know, the, 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 um, our experiences really are important, right? And a lot of times for me, I think, you know, Bill Hooks talks have talked about this quite a bit in her younger years, you know, that creative expression for us, it is, has to become, has to be part of our scholarship, right? You know, we're, we're very, you know, we're very narrative and that has to be appreciated. It has to start being appreciated by the university. So, you know, I, I certainly, I just applaud this work. You know, I'm, I just, I Thank love you. everything you're doing here. Thank you so much. And there's a history of silencing, right? Silencing people of color. And it starts with our families, unfortunately. And, and then it is systemic. So when you are trying to tell your story, 
you get constantly silent, devalued. Well, that's not what we do here in the academy. You know, you have to go out and research and, and you want to say, well, why can't I create my own space that looks a little different? And maybe years from now, that will be the standard, right? Well, you know, that's not what we do. So I continue to really value how fortunate I've been to be in a space that allows me, you know, I, I can pretty much go in, in whatever direction works for me. I'm never leaving the best. So just, if my dean, if you're watching, I'm not going to leave. <laughs> um, but I also, I talk to students all the time about, about this idea of um, risk and the risks that we take. I couldn't, um, I don't know how long it would have taken me to write something like that last piece that I did while if my mom was still alive, right? And I was really afraid that the minute it was in the air, other people in my family would be very angry with me for sharing that. But once I got my sisters okay, my sisters approval because they were in the house with me, you know, that we all, the three of us grew up in the same house. And once they were crying, they were laughing, and they were like, just, just do it, just get it out there. It was great. So they were the only people, as far as I'm concerned, who really mattered. They were, if they had said, you know, you're crazy, then we would have had an issue. But I was, I was validated by their experience. And then also my middle sister, when I read them the first one, the first poem about the day that my mom died, she gave me notes. She, originally I had her as the person who opens the door and says, mom's gone. And she was like, that was not me. That was our stepdad because I was with mom in the room. But in my memory, it was her. I cannot picture him at all. I picture her. I could even describe the shirt she was wearing, which was the shirt she was wearing. She said, no, I was in the room. I was in the room when she died. I was the only one in the room. And it was, it was our dad who was the one who told you. So I took the note because she was right. Uh, and that was just really interesting. But I agree, I agree 100% about the importance of the creative because we're asked to do an artificial separation, right? Well, no, your academic stuff, what does that mean, right? And if you're studying comics, good luck. <laughs> good luck separating that, <laughs> right? You know, the, like your creative self is just like, yay, comics. Yay, comments. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again for that. Um, Lucero, thank you for your comments. Um, I'm just going to read Lucero's comment and I'll now tell you who she is. She says, thank you for being an amazing educator that it, who has deeply impacted my life, inspired me to love literature and blend comics with culture. You're the best. So Lucero is a, a lovely um, former student of mine from Modesto who is now moving on to Fresno State. And we, Lucero and I just took a drawing course together. So because of COVID, I was able to enroll in my first formal drawing class. I've, I've been all independent learning up until now. And it was, it was a bear and it was awesome because I was familiar with all of the materials, but not in all of the different ways to use them. So I managed to convince Lucero to come along and also take the course, which was entirely online. And, and the other day, so our finals were due on fr Friday, Saturday, and I was a little behind, so I was a little lot behind. And so I was doing all of these charcoal pieces, one after the other after the other, and then suddenly my fingers started to hurt a little bit. And I turn up my fingers, and my fingers are bleeding. And I'm sitting there going, I'm bleeding for my art. <laughs> So that was really funny and kind of unfortunate because I had to stop. But thank you very much for that um, comment. <laughs> oh, and I apologize to Lucero. I had to uh, mute you there for a second because there was background noise. But is there anything you'd like to add? Or if other folks have questions, I'm happy to answer or thoughts about you know, any of the, any of the work that came up or, um, so Linda I, Berry is one of my favorite people, mm -hmm. one of my favorite creators. So I do have a question. Yeah. Um, when you use this, te this pedagogic technique with your students, um, do you ask them to reflect on 
a sense of ownership over whatever fears, traumas, anxieties they may have expressed, put into the world, into this form. Do you ask them, do they feel different about it? Is there a sense of ownership that comes over these experiences because they engaged in this productive creative process? I do. And what we do is a debrief. So uh, depending on the class, in composition, for example, there's so much writing that happens in that class that I also integrate drawing. So I want to make sure that they have an understanding of the labor of comics, right? Not just, oh, they're so pretty and we read them in five minutes and then they have no idea that it took, you know, five years to create this one graphic novel. So I have them draw. So they start to develop an appreciation of rhetorical choices, of um, the labor. The difference, one of my favorite things is I bring in a bunch of um, these, these Tombow pens, these you know, really cool dual brush pens. So you have a brush tip on one end and then a fine tip on the other. And I bring a bunch of them in. I try to, I try to bring in brand new ones, really nice ones. And I let them draw with those. And they're just amazed at the, the, the difference in material and how they're, what they produce is elevated by good material, right? And then we write a reflection piece on that, on what is it like? And sometimes they're difficult to read because they'll say things like, if only I had these kinds of pens, if only I had, you know, this, I could create good work. And I'm like, take it. It's not really the pen. <laughs> it's that you did, you put a thing into the world. So yeah, I try to do plenty of that. And then also encourage students in, in normal times to come by my office or to reach out. It's really interesting right now because the office hour visits right now are very long. They tend to be very long. Students just, they, and, and I, I, um, I allow it because I'm happy to see them, but they just want to talk and talk. And, and then once they start, I can't give them any materials, but once they start drawing, something opens up and they want to talk about the process. And then as far as the, um, you know, sort of owning, owning their own anxiety, I try to make sure that, that they are acknowledging that it's a normal feeling and that we're all going through the same thing and that other people don't get to judge their art, right? Especially not for class. That, but, so I'll have students sometime who, sometimes who come in and they'll say, well, I really wanted to draw X, but I have no drawing skill, so I didn't do the assignment. And I'll say, well, let's do it now. No, I can't, I, I can't draw. Can you, I'm sorry, can you make a mark on the paper? <laughs> yeah, I could do, can you do a little rock? Yeah, can you do a stick figure? Yeah, well then, and I have a nice table outside of my office. I'll say, here, I want you to go and draw this panel and come back when you're done and don't, no one's judging it. The only, you know, like the, the best dissertation is a done dissertation. <laughs> That's what I want. So go out and just finish it, just finish it. And I don't think there's ever been a time when I've done that with a student where they come back with a, you know, bad drawing, whatever that means. They're, they're just sort of withholding their own skill because they're so afraid of the judgment part. So once we, we crack away at that, chip away at it, then we can get to the, oh, I can, I can actually draw. The other thing I like to do is in the fall, we participate in Inktober. We do Inktober, which is that 30 days of drawing in October. That is the best, because I do it too and I almost never finish, <laughs> but I start with them. And I give them extra credit if they finish. And they, uh, man, some of the talent that comes out of that is so, it's just great. I love the fall classes are the best. And then the spring classes are great because we work leading up to the, the Latinx Comic Arts Festival, which happens in March. So we're doing work and they know that they're gonna get to meet cartoonists. And that's another magical thing for them that they get to meet all kinds of folks whose work they're reading. Yeah. Can 
I say something about the festival? So I'm not really asking permission. So the, <laughs> the Latinx Comic Arts Festival happens in Modesto, California every March now. That's our, that's our month for the festival. And um, Dr. Craig mentioned that this is a, a moment to highlight Latinx creators, um, so artists, writers, um, comic arts educators, and, and I say uh, Latinx and friends because I, you know, I'm not carding anyone, or, <laughs> but that's the majority of folks, it really is, and we're in the Central Valley. So our student population is uh, about 55% Latinx, and this is an opportunity for me to bring folks to our campus who are working in comics, working in comic arts, and we have this really cool um, campus convention and it's in a great room space. We also have a, uh, a low rider exhibit. So in the parking lot, we have, I can't remember, I think we had 30 the year before last and I expect that it's gonna be larger um, coming up, but it's just this wonderful opportunity for students to meet creators and to really become part of something and for them to talk about some, you know, take a book and, and say, I read your book and I wanna to talk to you about your book and be able to have that conversation. And it's, um, I, I think I'm, I may be overusing magical, but it's a magical time. So this coming year, we will, will have some virtual stuff going on related to that since we've been virtual for the last couple of years. And I invite everyone, I'll share the, the links and such with uh, Dr. Jordan so that he can share that with you. Um, so that folks can join us for that. All right, so uh, if there are no more questions, um, Dr. Rojas, thank you very much for that talk. You can see how many I kept talking um, and asking questions. So I'm sorry, but when it took me so long, I took so much of your time up. Um, and I actually put another comment in there about you reminding me of the importance of memoir writing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it's I, for me, it's an early form of memory studies in rhetoric yeah. and public culture. So I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the, of the work you, you're doing with that also. Thank you. I love that. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are um, finishing it up and we have one last talk to do. Um, and that one will take place on June 1st at seven, Tuesday, June 1st, 2021 at 7 p.m. Central Time. And the Zoom link is attached. And that will be um, our Extending Empathy Talk project talk by um, um, Drs. Byron Craig. Who is that, I wonder? And Stephen Rocco from Indiana University. And the, talk, uh, the title of our talk will be Exercising America's Demons, Race, Politics, and Empathy. Um, and, and I really would invite you to come. We will be um, discussing the 100th a commemoration of the Tulsa Black Wall Street Massacre by an angry white mob. And, and in the talk, we plan on working through um, the, the racial and political demons since Tulsa, and then discussing how a radical empathy, which I brought tonight, is, is necessary to work through where we are as a nation, politically, culturally, socioeconomically, et cetera. So that will be the last talk of, the, uh, of, the, um, of this series. And, um, and uh, uh, if, there are, uh, if there's anything else, we are finished for the evening. So we certainly appreciate you, Dr. Rojas, for your talk tonight. And thank you everyone for coming. And thank you to the crew. Thank you. I just want to say thank you again to uh, Dr. Jordan for the invite. And everyone should come to uh, on Thursday for our next ReggieCon event, right? Don't forget about that. And um, I'm really happy that I was able to be here today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>